Hello everybody, welcome to Wonky Angle, where I talk about electronic music, both new and old. And today, we're talking about album number six from BT, These Hopeful Machines. I am kind of at a loss for words on where to begin with uh, These Hopeful Machines, my other giant all-time favorite from this guy. I guess I can start with saying this was the place where I started when I first discovered BT in high school. It was an album that I was simultaneously worried about, but also really intrigued by. It came from a somewhat polarized reaction from a couple of iTunes reviews I saw at the time or something like that. While most people seemed to be really into it, uh, you still saw that subset of people who were just really against this one. I might have seen accusations of selling out, but honestly, that's not really even worth bringing into the conversation at this point, since he arguably did that years before this album dropped, as I've discussed in previous videos. And as I've always said, a turn for the commercial does not inherently make an album bad. Heavily commercial stuff can be good, too. This happens to be a great example. The thing about this album that actually worried slash excited me, though, was its length. This thing is 108 minutes long, spread out over 12 tracks, half of which break the 10 minute barrier, and the shortest of which still clocks in at a not unsubstantial 5 and a half minutes. Not that I was remotely scared by 10 minute tracks in my later high school years, I mean you're talking to a diehard Orbital fan here, but it did initially look like the kind of thing that was probably best meant for already converted fans of BT rather than a good jumping on point for new fans. If you talk to me now though, I would say that if BT is the kind of artist who's interested you in general but you don't know where to start, I would say start here. Is the album long? Sure, but quite frankly, this is the shortest hundred minutes of music I've ever sat through. It breezes by super quickly and doesn't waste a single second of your time. If people complaining about, ooh, it's so commercial, got you kind of worried, I mean, it does have a mainstream kind of sound to it, if you want to call it that. Especially coming out of his last album, which was anything but mainstream. I guess this was something to more service the appetites of those who jumped in on uh, the movement and still life days. But maybe not entirely that either. There's definitely some elements from this binary universe that you can pick up in several tracks on this thing. I mean, needless to say, this album is a crap ton to take in. But like I said, this is still one of my all-time favorites. And I still stand by that. Not quite a 10, there are some little problems I have with it here and there, which I'll talk about in a bit. It's not the kind of album where I'll be totally bewildered if someone's not as into it as I am. But it is still ridiculously great to me. I will say if you're not sure about whether or not you're going to like this album, uh, the first track here pretty much sets the tone perfectly in every way. If you're not a fan of this track, you're, you're likely to have a bad time with the rest of the album. But Jesus fucking Christ, suddenly is epic. Eight minutes long, not one of the most elaborate tracks, but clearly the one most meant to hook you in right away. First thing you hear is a bunch of random abstract effects spazzing about until they all slowly start to form into a more conventional dance groove with some guitar licks here and there. Still not exactly straightforward four on the floor trance or anything, surprising amount of random offbeat details thrown all over the place, and shooting by at such high speed that you might not even notice they're there at all. And then finally, uh, Christian Burns starts singing. Yo, and your emotion, I'm on your side, I say your prayer. Yeah, this is another one of those albums that was really hard for me to write about and listen to at the same time. Or heck, analyzing most of these with a critical eye has been pretty damn hard because all the vocal hooks on this album are just way too easy for me to get into and sing along with, and that takes up most of my attention over anything that might be in the background. Every melody on this album is catchy and really easily memorable. I can easily play any hook from this album in my head without actually listening to it. Oh, and the singer's delivery is always amazing, too. Everyone is totally getting into their performances and delivering a lot of emotional pathos, unlike a lot of the performances on emotional technology. And suddenly, Christian Burns is just completely on top of his game. He is just totally selling it. And I love it when you fall to me suddenly. 
That is totally off key. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention the chorus has a switch up into a more rock heavy sound with rough guitars and live drumming from KJ Sokka of Pendulum fame. And there's this badass outro where BT just goes absolutely nuts with the effects. It almost resembles a dubstep drop if you look at it sideways or something, or only heard some wubbing synth in one ear at a point or two. But it is just totally off the chain, and BT has so many synth effects and stutter, and it is just a mind-blowingly dense storm of sound design. Until it finally just breaks free from the madness and then slowly gets quieter. Not, not a straight fade out, just getting quieter. And it smoothly transitions into this ambient section and starts out the next track. Oh yeah, the album is two continuous mixes, because why not? It's not the kind of super tight mix where you can't tell when tracks begin or end, the transitions are pretty obvious, but it's just that little touch to help bring everything together. So yeah, Suddenly is definitely an opener that grabs your attention, lets you know what you're getting into with this album, makes sure to totally make use of every single second of time and makes 8 minutes feel like 3. But then there's The Emergency, featuring a co-production from Andrew Bayer and Boom Jinx. A 10 minute track that feels like it goes by in like two minutes or something. This is one of my favorite BT tracks ever. It's, I think it's on par with Good Morning Kaya, even without the advantage of my having known this one longer. It is primarily a pretty straightforward vocal pop trance kind of track with clean and polished and smooth synth textures that wouldn't feel out of place on, say, Dead Mouse random album title, but with way more bells and whistles than anything on there. I mean, there's a minute and a half intro. First you got like 30 seconds of ambience with like little shifting and chiming electric piano chords way in the background creating a really expansive space and texture. Then after some build up with, I think Kristen Burns voice soaked and reverbed and chopped up into oblivion. At least I think it's him since he's credited as the backing vocalist on this track. But about 30 seconds in we switch over to this really delicate and emotive piano piece. Do 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 do. Just letting all the sound and emotion really sink in, and then it slowly builds up into the main bulk of the track with vocals delivered by, of course, BT himself. Obviously, far from his first vocal performance, but we've really come a long way from his below average performances on ESCM. I think this track has his best vocal performance to date, too. Either this or Satellite, but here he shows a bit more range and control over his voice. He hits some higher notes, too. Also, like Satellite's, uh, the lyrics are emphatically not the focus. In fact, the lyrics here are probably worse, because the main hook is basically just I love you, I love you, I love you, today's the day that I love you. <laughs> and at least with Satellite, the lyrics were kind of obtuse and tried to be more poetic and metaphorical or something, even if I don't have a single clue what they mean. <laughs> but you really don't care about the actual content of the lyrics for a track like this. It's not I love you, I love you, today's the day I love you, it's I love you. It's the delivery that matters first and foremost, and BT is just absolutely selling this. He's just he's just delivering the most simple of simple phrases, but with so much joy and passion put into his voice that you can't help but get into it as well. Oh yeah, and did I mention that this track is a full-on orchestral outro? Yeah, after the bulk of the emergency is passed, there's a nice long pad of orchestral strings to close out everything and really cement all the strong emotions put into this track. It's really powerful stuff. Just fills me with all these warm, fuzzy feelings like I want to go around hugging people or something. Even though I don't typically like doing that. Speaking of warm and fuzzy, every other way, if you were put off by the over-the-top hugeness of the first two tracks, this this one moves into a more subtle and understated place. Primarily a intimate acoustic guitar and glockenspiel driven piece, with lead vocals from Jess. Uh, providing a much moodier, but still no less emotionally potent performance. But this is still a BT track, an 11 minute one no less, so of course he's going to go out all out this binary universe on this track and just fill every nook and cranny with glitchy effects and sidetracks 
that never impact the pacing in any way. And he'll have soaring rock sections with live drumming from Brian Mantia, aka Brain. And he'll have an outro where he just goes all out with the effects again and letting them take the focus above all else. Just glitching everything into oblivion except for the drumming. And it sounds awesome. And it leads us directly into The Light in Things, a much more simplistic trans track co-produced by Airwave. Uh, well, at least simplistic by the standards of this album. It's about as simplistic as something like Dreaming from Movement and Still Life. It doesn't have multiple parts or major side tracks. It's just based around mostly straightforward dance grooves and Jess's airy vocal performance, sometimes chopped up and covered in reverb. Not a ton to say about it, but it accomplishes everything you'd want out of a straight trance like this, and it delivers its hook magnificently. I see the light and things, I watch the world go by. Rosa Jericho, actually the lead single from this album, it one of t is one of two instrumentals on this thing. And uh, BT is of course not going to disappoint in that department. It's mostly centered around pretty straightforward dance grooves, but with lots of plunky and jumpy synth melodies. Boop, boop, beep, boop, beep. And an absolutely vast sea of glitches and tiny details. Also featuring uh, help from the then newcomer producer Matt Lange, adding even more detail and glitchiness to the mix. But we're never gonna hear about that guy ever again after this, right? But yeah, as strange sounding as it may be, is surprisingly pretty dang catchy. The main melody may jump all over the place, but it sticks in the head. Always nice to have some variety with a track like this. Or with something like Forget Me, which is primarily just a straight rock track. Although a lot more fast paced or intense than anything you'd find on emotional technology. BT even plays most of the instruments himself, like guitar and bass and modular synth and the like. Though KJ Sokka does the drums again. And it's absolutely awesome, too. Like, you really get into BT's performance once again, and the melodies are really infectious. But let's remember, life is a beautiful mistake. It's over almost way too quickly, despite being nine minutes long. The track also ends in a little performance from BT's daughter, Kaya, now six years old and actually capable of singing along with the song herself. It's really cute and heartwarming. Oh yeah, and the last two entire minutes of the track is just field recordings. Rain and crickets and some other sounds, because, hey, why not? Call it padding if you like, but I do always enjoy me the sounds of nature sometimes, and we all know well by now that BT just loves that stuff too. So now we've discussed the first half of this album. I'll say this, if the album were only these first six tracks, these hopeful machines might have a shot at the coveted 10 out of 10 rating. Maybe. I don't actually know. It'd be close, at least, to zip in and zip out and deliver six mind-blowingly amazing tracks that are all among my favorites from BT ever, and my favorites in this particular genre, or whatever genre applicable. The second half of this album, in my opinion, is not quite as strong as the first, though. Maybe it half comes from the fact that the album is consistently mixed pretty loud, and my ears could probably stand a break at that point. And I rarely actually stop the album halfway to give myself that break. But, I don't know, it also speaks to my love for this material that I rarely feel the urge to actually give myself a break halfway through. <laughs> I guess BT's little field recording outing at the end of Forget Me is enough. I know the second half doesn't start nearly as amazingly as the first half, though. A Million Stars is a track that I constantly go back and forth with, depending on my mood. Sometimes I absolutely love it, and sometimes I think it doesn't measure up to other tracks on here. I mean, it's got quite the impressive credits list. Vocals are first of all handled by the one and only Kirsty Hawkshaw, which is always a plus in any context. But there's also co-production from Sultan and Ned Shepard. Uh, cool, I guess. <laughs> And most bewilderingly, Ulrich Schnauss of all people co-wrote it too. Would not have been able to guess he was involved if you hadn't told me, but I guess I'll take it. The actual track though, it doesn't always justify being 12 minutes long for me. I mean, sometimes it does. I can always really get into Kirsty Hawkshaw's airy and delicate performance. I mean, I'll always enjoy her appearances on anything by default. Though I, I think she's a lot better on Dreaming. Like, this isn't the best performance I've ever heard from her or anything. The straightforward trance buildups and payoffs are really enjoyable, and there's plenty of more subtle sections to break things up, but 
mostly it can get a little repetitive. I mean, she says, you feel in love again? over and over and over and over. If I'm not in the mood for it, that can get a little stale. But, you know, not always. Like I said, it depends on my mood. I love the melodies on it. There's a lot there to enjoy. Even at my absolute lowest point of enjoyment, I'll still be captivated by it for a good 10 minutes. Just kind of half wish BT had gone a bit weirder with this one like he did on the first couple of tracks on this album. This is kind of more straightforward, like the light and things. Which is cool too, but, you know, Anyways, after that, you get two more pop rock tracks that are similarly not nearly as good as Forget Me, with uh, Love Can Kill You and Always. The former I half feel like I kind of wanted to be my least favorite because it is the shortest and has the least to it. But I won't deny that it is catchy and it has got stuck in my head pretty damn easily. If you're gonna have two tracks of this similar style and sound, you may as well deliver two equally catchy songs. And I'll still take Love Can Kill You over Circles or Animals or The Only Constant Is Change from, from Emotional Technology. Similar feelings on Always, though I am sometimes kind of put off by the vocal presence of Rob Dickinson of Catherine Wheel fame. This late in the album and we get a new singer we haven't heard yet, and his voice sounds really different from BT and Christian Burns. His voice is a lot deeper and rougher. He sounds a lot older, too, even though I don't know if he actually is. He just kind of catches me off guard at this point, but, you know, he still delivers a pretty solid performance here, too, and again, the catchiness of the track wins out in the end. These two tracks are still both very good ones that mainly just have the disadvantage of having to share time with some of my favorite tracks ever, so, you know. Anyways, uh, I may have seemed kind of lukewarm on the second half of the album so far, but the next two tracks finally return us to the mind-blowing level that the first half delivered a lot more consistently. Le Nocturne de Lumiere is the other instrumental on this album. It does sound pretty similar to Rosa Jericho, and honestly, if you asked me to hum the melody of this one, I wouldn't really be able to. Uh, the best I'd be able to do is try and hum that one bass line that carries over most of it. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Mm -mm, mm -mm. But that lack of a hummable tune is purely because BT straight up doesn't give you any hook or melody that you could hum like that. It's easily the strangest and most unconventional sounding track on the album, basically a This Binary Universe type track that just so happens to have a dance beat. I mean, it starts out with a long ambient intro with lots of sparkling and chiming noises. I mean, as usual, it just has an absolute crap ton of detail and texture. There's no beat for a good minute or so, and it takes another minute for the main groove to actually kick in. Once it does, mm, it's some good stuff. You got that bass line, which makes everything really tight and danceable, while on top you have like five layers of effects just flying all over the place. A bunch of plunky synth lines that resemble the ones from Rosa Jericho, but chopped up even more. And of course there are several sidetracks to let dramatic expansive pads of various chiming sounds to get more focus. There's a kalimba solo at one point too that gets combined with some glockenspiels and guitars and similar sounds you'd find all over his last album, especially on tracks like 1.618. And all these elements get worked into the core groove as well to amp up their effect. There's a part where the tempo sounds like it's slowing down to give way to an ambient pad, but then just picks right back up where it left off. And it ends with a whole bunch of just violin sounds, both plucked and bowed, along with some weird animal noise. This is just a track that has so much substance and strangeness in it. It's the kind of thing I most like seeing out of BT, because he clearly is having so much fun with every second of this. And then there's The Unbreakable, which features Rob Dickinson's vocals again on a slightly less catchier track, but with a much more emotionally evocative and dynamic performance. I find him to be a much more likable presence here than I did on Always. And also doesn't hurt that uh, this track has a lot more elements going into it. It starts out with these little chiming melodies that I think are played on like a Chinese toy piano or something like that. Do, 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 do. And it slowly transitions into a more fast-paced dance track that has a tiny bit of an 80s tinge to it or something. All building up to one of the best sounding chorus sections of any song on here. It's got a lot of guitars as usual, but also space for warm ambient pads and your typical trance percussion. And the chorus is really catchy too. Even the sun and the light of the day Never returns, never turns my way 
ah, ah, I'm not breaking. The verses are a lot more free-flowing and let instruments slowly fade in and out and like various different kinds of guitars and synths and orchestral sounds. And as credited in the album liner notes, who knows what else. <laughs> it's a ton of fun and really gets me in the feels, as it were. And finally, that leaves the ending of the album, a mostly straight acoustic guitar cover of The Ghost in You by The Psychedelic Furs. I'll admit, uh, the original Ghost in You is a song that I think is really good, but not one I have a really strong emotional connection to. And BT surprisingly makes the track sound a lot less unique than it did before. Uh, mainly because of BT's singing, he doesn't have quite a distinctive voice as Richard Butler. That said, he still delivers some strong atmosphere, the guitars are accompanied by plenty of ambient effects and other minor details in the background. He obviously loves the song, so he's able to deliver a pretty strong performance. And uh, the backing vocals from Amelia June help make the track sound more intimate as well. Like, it's, it feels like it's just the two of them sitting out on a porch or something. That's really nice. I mean, it's probably my least favorite track on the album, and it says something that I still don't really have much of anything bad to say about it. So that's every track on the album. For the people who are like, the with all the ghost producers. I've actually name-dropped pretty much everyone in the credits already. Uh, the only other credits left are Mike DiMaggio, who does some random technical work like time correcting and vocal comps, like he does on most BT albums. Uh, you got Greg Collins, who helped BT with the mixing on Forget Me and Always, assumingly because that kind of rock track isn't fully in BT's wheelhouse. And you got the usual mastering engineer, Emily Lazar, alongside another one, Joel Laporta. I presented everyone else as collaborators, though, because that's kind of what they are. And I see absolutely no reason for there to be a stigma for that kind of thing when everyone gets their due credits here and BT still does the vast majority of the work on the album. I mean, BT just shouted out Emily Lazar on Twitter the other day for being his go-to mastering engineer on pretty much everything, so that's nice. But I digress. So yeah, that's these hopeful machines. I'm aware this album will not be for everyone. If your biggest problem is that it's com too commercial sounding for you, I get it. Even though it's still far from the most commercial thing BT's ever done, and he indulged on any idea that came to his mind to make these tracks bigger and better and more impressive. But fine, it is commercial sounding, there's only two instrumentals. If you don't like singing in your music, you're not as likely to get into it. But I usually prefer instrumentals over vocal tracks myself, I had no problem getting into any of this. The catchiness of every track and the emotional delivery of every singer well justifies the lack of straight instrumentals, and BT is still nice enough to deliver two of those that are among his best. You could tell me that the production isn't the best in the world, and it is a classic case of BT contributing to the loudness war by squeezing audio at the highest peaking levels in many parts. But I'm still going to say the production here is consistently excellent. Because even if it happens to be consistently loud, there's still a definite sense of space to it. Every element has its own breathing room. Which, given the insane amount of elements that go into it, that should really be saying something. You could tell me that the lyrics are dumb, and okay, I don't have a strong comeback to that criticism, because it, it really, besides, it is really not remotely about the actual words being said. I mean, I could be a smartass and ask, BT, why is today the day that I love you, and, and why not, why only today and not any other day? <laughs> I could ask why he has, uh, why do you have a six-year-old singing about how life is a beautiful mistake and she doesn't want to be perfect anymore? That doesn't sound like the kind of thing a six-year-old would say. I could be like, why does Rob Dickinson have such an affinity for the phrase one horse town? You, that was really such an evocative set of words that you felt compelled to deliver it in like five different ways. But I feel like saying things like that kind of misses the point of the album entirely. Who cares if it's not the smartest album on a lyrical level? Do we really need that out of trance artists? The delivery and hooks and production and song structures are way more important, and those are consistently fantastic, and none of the lyrics are distractingly bad. I mean, even on the emergency, BT puts so much joy into his singing I love you that you feel with him anyway. Really the only main criticism I personally have of this album is that it loses steam in its second half. It's, it's only great, while the first half is incredible. I don't even think the album overstays its welcome in any way. 
Like I said, despite being 100 minutes long, it's the fastest 100 minutes I've ever experienced. BT utilizes every second of time so well, this entire thing zips by super quickly. I could say that I would want the track listing to be shorter, cut some of the less memorable tracks, but I don't even really want that either. I, I like having it perfectly the way it is, with all 12 tracks in the order that they are right now. So, I guess I'll leave it at that. Um, I don't really have much of anything else to say besides this is still probably in my top 10 favorite albums of all time. It holds up just as well to me now as it did when I first heard it, if not even better. And make sure you check it out at some point. I'm overall feeling a 9.5 out of 10. But of course, this is just my opinion. You can feel free to disagree with it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. So leave the comments in the comment thing down there. Shout out to my Patreon supporters. There are some people. You want to add yourself to that list or make me review something? Link to my Patreon is in the description. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all for today. See you next time.